our topic this afternoon that I was given was to talk a little bit about what the Bible has to say about oneness, the importance of oneness. Uh, this morning, in the particular uh, study that I presented, we, we reviewed the story of the four men that brought the paralyzed man into the presence of Jesus, how they work together. Uh, in this particular study this afternoon, we want to look at an illustration from Ephesians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the body and the different parts of the body working together. Uh, the title of our study this afternoon is Fitly Joined Together. A body owes its strength, its beauty, its comfort, its healthfulness, and its happiness to the position and proper function of the different members of which it is composed. Uh, any book on anatomy and physiology will teach you that this is the case. Uh, we would indeed be monstrosities rather than men if any part of us should be shifted from its present condition and position and function. So this is the point. Try, dear friend, to be in the body of Christ where and what you were meant to be and to work in harmony with it. For Christ's church is called to have every member. How many member? Every member uh, joint and part in its proper place and function. The church of God on earth at this time, God's remnant church, is not a monstrosity. And we need to be careful that we do not act as though we thought that she was. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, as we take time now to consider the sacred scriptures, we invite your presence to be among us. Lord, please help us to understand and to work together as you have designed us to do at this time and with this church. Thank you for making this possible in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians chapter 4. And we do have 32 verses in the chapter. We're not going to read all 32. I would like us to take a look at the first half of the chapter. So please follow along with me. Ephesians chapter 4, the very first verse. The Bible says... I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And how many of you are thankful for that? Amen. Without it, there would be no hope. Verse 8, wherewith he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and did something. What did Christ do? Gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That, hen that henceforth be no more, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive." But speaking what? The truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. And that's the title that we have selected for this study. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And in those verses, there's enough information to have 10 sermons on this particular subject. We're just going to cover some of the main highlights and see what the Bible has to say about the importance of oneness in the body of Christ. From our text, we find that the Apostle Paul is very anxious that the saints at Ephesus should be closely knit together, like different parts of the physical body. The fourth chapter of Ephesians is all about unity and how we maintain it. Unity is not an easy thing to attain, is it? Have you noticed that in your local church? Or how about in your own family? In the family that I grew up with, I lived in lots of different homes. My caseworker told me one time that that the tally was around 16 homes growing up. But in my family where I spent most of my years growing up, my uncle and aunt that took me in, there were five of us kids. And unity among us was, I'll just say, not the easiest thing. There were four sisters and one brother. And sometimes I kind of jokingly say, especially when my sisters are around, that it was a rough existence, but I was able to bear with it. Of course, if you were to talk to my sisters today, they would seem to suggest that they spoiled their only brother. And I'm here to tell you that I don't think that that's true. In many large families, and even in small ones, there are times, sometimes most unfortunate things take place. There are jabs and disagreements. When I was a kid, my buddies and I were riding our bicycles in the hood. And we were racing them, them up and down the street, riding up on the curb, seeing how far we could go, setting up jumps and going down hills and going over the jumps. And on one particular afternoon, summer afternoon, one of my little sisters rode up on her bike and she proclaimed that she was going to ride bikes with us. And, you know, my buddies looked at me and, you know, they, you just give that kind of look to each other and it was like they were saying, hey, Take care of your sister. And so I told my sister, you can't ride with us. And she said, why not? And for me and my buddies, we thought that that would be an obvious thing. And so we looked at her and said, well, because you're a girl, you know. And we, we had a fort, too. And outside of our fort door, it just simply said, no girls allowed. And we'd take care of our business inside of there, and they'd knock on the door, and we'd just say, read the sign. 
So anyway, my sister, she said, I'm going to ride bikes with you today. I said, no. And uh, when I told her the reason why, she didn't particularly uh, take that very well. And so she got off her bike, and of course I was standing on the ground. I was not on the pedals or the seat, and I was, I was standing there, and I didn't know for sure what she was up to. And she came walking up to me, and she took her little fist and just wound up and caught me right below the sternum. Knocked the wind out of me. I fell over on the ground. And as I was trying to catch my breath, she went riding off into the distance with my buddies. And later they said, hey, any sister that can take the wind out of their brother like that deserves to ride with us. <laughs> and so sometimes unity in a family is a tough thing. In the home circle, in the church circle, we look at the world in general, it, in its many nations, nationalities, it's various corporations, societies, associations. Uh, we see disunion and discord manifested everywhere. In the United States alone, have you noticed that? In the United States alone, it seems all we hear about is division, anger, disagreement, fighting, arguing this point or that point, etc. And one would think that in society, there would be one place where you could go and see peaceful unity exemplified. And where would that be? The Christian church. And while I believe that unity does exist in the church, there is much that can be done to improve that unity. Even within God's beloved last day remnant church, unity is something that is a challenge to maintain. We, we are a worldwide church family. Brothers and sisters in Christ from nearly every nation on the earth. And praise God for, having, for that being the case. And having this oneness that the Apostle Paul speaks of here, I believe is crucial. It's crucial in the completion of our task and mission at hand to share the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels' messages. And as we read through the book of Ephesians, this particularly the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, in my mind's eye, I can see the Apostle Paul with his manacled hands, the prisoner of the Lord, writing to the believers of the church, encouraging them to be truly one, to walk worthy of the vocation by which they were called by one spirit. He entreats them with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, to bear and forbear with one another in love. And he most touchingly and tenderly pleads his own imprisonment as an argument with them to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. By the remembrance of my bonds, he seems to say, put yourselves into the blessed bonds of brotherly love. And then he adds, there is one body. How many bodies? One body, one spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Both the inward belief and the outward confession of it, they were to be one, both in the inward belief and outward confession of it. They were to be one. They were not divided on the basic pillars of which they believed. So the Apostle Paul begged them to be divided in nothing. When he reminded them that he who ascended on high is the same Jesus who descended first to the lower parts of the church, I think he intended to remind them of the continuity of the work of Christ. 
that it was the same Christ who both descended and ascended. He's emphasizing there's no change in the worker. For the one work was worked by the one person, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why then should the church be split, divided, and hold hundreds of opinions as if Christ were divided? The Apostle Paul continues to tell us that when Christ ascended on high, he gave all sorts of officers that were necessary for the leadership of his church. Christ was the head. Christ was what? Christ was the head. But the very fact that Christ was the head did not remove the need for leaders or leadership in his church. I don't know if you have heard that over the past year or two, but I have. Read some articles on the idea that because Christ is the head of the church, then there's no headship after that. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul here is not teaching that. <laughs> He's pointing out very clearly that Christ is the head, and then there are other parts of the body that do their function that have important leadership roles and functions. Just because Christ is the head of the church, that does not remove the need for leaders in his church. So what did Christ do? He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and so on, all for this purpose, for the perfecting of the saints. And I hope you believe that through Christ's work and his great plan of redemption, that we can mature and have our characters complete and perfected in him. It's God's power. It's his great work, in, his perfect work in us and for us. Let me turn that around. It's his perfect, God's perfect work for us. We call that justification. And then God's perfect work in us. We call that what? Sanctification. It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body or the church of Christ. And how far? Till we all come in what? Unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And I don't know how you could get any more full or complete than that. And that's what Christ wants to do for you. That's what Christ wants to do for me. That's what he wants to do for his church. It is this that the Apostle Paul aimed at. That the saints should be one in Christ Jesus and built up and grow. And then remembering that the one very frequent cause of division in the church is the instability of, of the minds of man. He urged them to be no more children Tossed, what? To and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And I believe in the church today that every wind of doctrine is huffing and puffing. But you and I, we do not need to be caught up in it. Apostle Paul continues to say that they might know what they believed and not be deceived or misled, in my words, by the whims of man. To have oneness of belief and practice. Well, in this chapter, does he give any hints on and ideas of what that looks like? Uh, the first thing I'd like to bring out from the text is that we are to grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even who? Even Christ. We are to understand, and I believe that we do, we are to understand this great point, this great truth, simply stated, Christ is the head of his church. 
union with Christ is essential to the life of his church. Men sometimes lose a foot or a leg or an arm or an eye or an ear. And I believe that is remarkable how a man may continue to successfully exist after he has lost important and vital parts of the body. But he cannot live if his head is taken away. Cut that off and the decapitated body is dead. How quick? In an instant. Thus, the church of God lives because Christ lives. Amen. And its life is entirely derived from him. If there were no Christ, there would be no life, no church. Union to Christ as our head will, I believe, bring many blessings to the church. Some of the allusions in the fourth chapter here are that union with Christ will bring growth to his church. Just as the body matures and grows, so the church of Christ will grow. If it's Christ's church, it will grow. Christ's church must seek to continuously, continuously increase. A living, active church is not like the building in which it meets. The material structure may never be enlarged, but if the church is a living one, it keeps growing. And it grows until the, the physical building and the parking lot can't hold any more. And then that kind of a church has a decision to make, don't they? The true church of Christ in the world is always advancing and multiplying. As the Apostle Paul says in our text, it makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The church that accepts Christ and his righteousness the church that obeys his prophetic word, the church that keeps his commandments will be edified, will be built up, and it will grow. And this growth and edification happens at the local congregation level, but it doesn't stay there. For the head of the church, Christ, gave his disciples that command to go into how much of the world? to all the world, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Christ's church was to not only grow in Jerusalem, not only throughout Judea, but through all Asia Minor and from there to the ends of the earth. And any church who does not have this in view, let me say that again. Any church that does not have this in view is not his church or needs to learn what his church really looks like. Any church whose focus is solely at the local level, any church which is only committed to keeping all of its resources, all of its gifts, all of its ta talents, at, etc. at the local level is not Christ's church. Christ's first century church that we read of in the book of Acts and his last century church that we read of in the book of Revelation chapters 12 and 14 had and have the world as their focus. Union to Christ as our head not only brings growth and increase, but it brings clarity to our mission and task at hand. It brings what? It brings clarity to the mission and task at hand. 
in Ephesians chapter 4, it's for the building up and the edifying of the church of Christ in love. And then they share that to the world. The first century church was given the gospel commission that's recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Very clear, uh, a very clear and distinct message. And were they faithful in that task of taking it to the world? Yes. Under the power of the uh, influence of the Holy Spirit, they took the gospel to the ends of the then known world in their generation. God's last day church has the same gospel commission. And in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter, we see that the everlasting gospel is shared to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people in the context of the three angels' messages. So, union with Christ as our head brings clarity to our mission and task at hand. I have talked to some who suggest that uh, the task at hand that I have shared with you in my three talks, uh, the three angels' message, there are some who believe that that is not our task at hand. Uh, I have friends who say our task, our mission is the gospel, but it has nothing to do with G uh, the three angels' message has nothing to do with the gospel, has nothing to do with Christ. And that's the mindset. I asked one particular individual who was uh, running and kind of parlaying for a certain leadership position that was, is a high leadership position in our territory. I asked him, why do you want to have this position? And he looked at me and said, because if I get this position, then I will have more authority. You know, we've talked a little bit about this issue of control. I'll have more authority to get across the mission that I believe our church needs. I just looked at him and said, wait a second. What do you mean your mission? Our church already has our mission. It was given to us by Christ. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. And I said, I know. And he said, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I get this position so that we can share this new vision and mission of the church. And I tried to humbly let him know that I would do everything that I could to make sure that he did not get that position. There are those who suggest the idea that this is not our task. That Jesus is not part of it. I find it very interesting because in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, it says that this is the revelation of who? Jesus. Of Jesus Christ. And you look up that word revelation and you know it. You've done that word study before. This word apocalypsis, which means not to keep something closed, but what does it mean? To open up and to reveal. It literally means to, uh, it was a fairly common word back in the first century. And it has the idea of taking the lid off of something, to open it up. And so the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus. It's taking the lid off of his life and showing us who he is and what he's about and what he has done and what he wants to continue to do for us as individuals and us as a church. This union with Christ as our head will also bless every member individually. Christ is not only essential to the body as a whole, but to every member of that body in detail. It is of no use for, let's say, my little finger to have unity with my hand and my arm if that arm is not connected to the body and my body not united with my head. So much each believer be personally joined to Christ. Whether he is only comparable to a little finger or is like a strong bone in the leg, he must equally be joined to the head. The smallest member of the body of Christ cannot live apart from Christ. Nor can the member with the largest responsibilities all alike 
both great and small, manifest or concealed, must draw their life from Christ, who is the head. And a church with its members in detail that only are united and focus in and on itself and have not prayerfully accepted the worldwide mission of the three angels' messages and are not keeping the commandments of God and united with Christ in the proclamation of that message, I know that's a long sentence, is no living church at all. You know what it is? In an end time context, it is Babylon. It is confusion. A church and its members may have the union of mere worldly enthusiasm in which men are focused together like molten metal, but the fire... If it is not of God and the Spirit's leading, though it creates a certain sort and form of fuzzy-wuzzy unity, does not create that living union which God has designed and effects for his end-time church. Paul then speaks about every joint and every part in its relationship to the body. We are many as well as one, and it is an amazing grace, I believe, of God when men and women, young and old, are able to merge their individuality and talents into fellowship of the church. You ought to remember that you by yourselves are not the church. And you must not keep on saying we if you are not doing anything at all in connection with it. You are yourself. I am myself. And we must look upon ourselves as a distinct individual. In the sight of God, we must be concerning ourselves to make sure that we are abiding in Christ. But if we are abiding in Him, let me say, if we are abiding in Him, we will be part of His body and part of His church. But if our focus is just for ourselves, we have nothing to do with the church You cannot speak of it as we, for the joints and parts of the body are meant to actively play their particular roles together. Next, we must be careful to find and keep our true position in the body of Christ. (laughs) This is kind of the main point I'd like to emphasize. Let me say it again. We must be careful to find and keep our true position in the body of Christ, in his church. You see, a body owes its strength, its beauty, its comfort, its healthfulness, its happiness to the position of the different members of which it is composed. There is no other place where our eyes could be so fitted for their work as they are now. Our feet are the best members to do what with? To walk with or to run with. And they are put in the proper place for that purpose. Suppose that uh, they were attached to our shoulders and we had to walk with them that way. That would be weird. And if our hands were where our feet are now, it would be exceedingly difficult and awkward to use them. So try, dear friend, to be in the body of Christ where you were meant to be. Many years ago, it was towards the beginning of my ministry, uh, my wife and the church nominating committee convinced me to help out in the cradle roll department. 
And so I was supposed to be in that position in the church for that officer year. And I did the best I could. I hung with it the best I could. And I believe I made it about two months. You know, so I was in there. And my wife said, you're telling the Bible story. So I kind of kneeled down there a little bit. And, uh, uh, you know, there were different stories of the Bible that we teach our kids. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, and I'm telling this story, you know, and I'm looking at these kids. And I knew I did not have their attention at all. And my wife said, here, grab this. This is a donkey. That will help tell the story. You know, those little felt donkeys and different animals. And so I was kind of going like this, and I had one of them sideways. I didn't even know I had it sideways. I wasn't paying close attention, you know, there. And one of the little kids said, donkeys don't do that. <laughs> uh, the church recognized that I was a bit out of place. And it wasn't a very pretty sight. Yeah, we would indeed be monstrosities rather than men. If any part of us should be shifted from its present position and proper function. But Christ church is called to have every joint and part in its proper place. His church is not a monstrosity. And we need to be very careful that we do not act as though we thought she was. Along with this, we ought also to remember that every joint and part are, operate in harmony to the body. The joints and parts are designed, uh, the joints and parts are not designed to attack it. If different parts of the body start attacking itself and other parts, does the body live very long? No. Any member of the body of Christ, any member of the church that feels or believes that it is his or her duty to attack other members of the church or its leadership or its beliefs or its values or its standards needs to understand that they are doing that which is not ordained of God and are only aiding the work of another whose design is to destroy the work of God. And that doesn't mean that when there are issues and problems, we don't sit down and prayerfully talk them through. It just simply means that as a member of the church, our part is to play our particular function where God has gifted us and talented us for the cause of moving the church forward and for the growth and maturity of the church. The text goes on to say that the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted. And I like that idea, don't you? This word compacted and fitly has the idea of being knit together and held together tight. The bones and the joints are compacted together. I used to run quite a bit and I've done a fair amount of a fair amount of mountain climbing and hiking. And a few years back I broke my leg in a climbing accident. And in the healing process of that, uh, I had one foot that was hurting pretty bad and I ended up having a bone scan on both of my feet. And the one sports medicine guy, he looked at the results of that, and he said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a minister. He said, yeah, I know that. But what have you done through life? And I said, what do you mean? And he pointed out that in the joint of my toes, you know, you have one bone coming this way and one bone coming this way, and you have the ends that come together at the joint. And on the ends there, it has a protective covering. I had worn most of that protecting covering off of the joints in my feet. He said, what do you do? I said, well, I used to run five miles every day. I've climbed mountains, most of the mountains in the northwest. I haven't done any climbing down here in California, but up in the northwest, all the highest mountains, I've had the fun and the privilege of topping out. But uh, the, the physician told me, you know, you got that joint there, and it's compacted together. 
and you're going to probably have issues a little later on in life because you've just kind of worn that through. Joints are in the body are compacted and they're meant to work properly. I've got a shoulder that I bummed up when I was playing baseball and uh, my doctor calls it a loose shoulder. And I guarantee you, a loose shoulder doesn't feel very well at times. Can't lay over on that side very long when I'm in bed. And so, when things are injured in the body of Christ, it affects the operation of the body of the church, just as it does our physical bodies. When all the bones work well together, they greatly assist the compactness of the body for the muscles and the tendons and so forth. I'm not describing that very well because I'm not a physician, but they bind the whole together. So in God's church, with all its members and moving parts, are organized and structured according, I believe, to God's design. The church's head and chief cornerstone is Christ. And he keeps all the parts running together properly as we surrender to the head day by day. Then Christ touches the hearts and minds of individuals who then form an organization and they might be able to start a local church in their area. From there, local churches make up the local conferences and the local conferences join together in a region that make up their union. And the unions are the building blocks of the divisions which make up the general conference. So what we have in terms of our church structure at this time in Earth's history are the four areas. The local church, the local conference, the local union, and the general conference with its 13 divisions with Christ as the head of the entire body. I believe it's a marvelous structure. You know what's kind of cool? When you look at the advice that Jethro gave to Moses as God's people were on the way to the promised land, you remember that? Jethro gave him advice and said, Moses, you're doing too much. You know, you're going to be going down in the grave early, and that's not going to do any of God's people any good. So you be as uh, the, like the communicator between the people and God, but divide the people up into thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. And God blessed that structure for his people, for his church at that time as they were heading to the promised land. We have that. I find it interesting that God has led the great Advent movement at the end of time as we're heading to the promised land with the same overall form of structure in four different levels. This structure and framework helps the body to function and move harmoniously throughout the entire world. It is compacted together in Christ to enable the mission and plans of God to go to how much of the world? All the world. And God compacted this great Advent movement, I believe, at the right time. The disappointed early Advent pioneers went back to their knees and back to their Bibles and found answers to their disappointment and the challenges that they faced at that time. Then they biblically put together a chain of Bible truth and doctrine which gave them their mission to share the gospel in the context of the three angels' messages. Then God helped them to get over their fears of structure and organization. And they finally chose the name in the early 1860s, Seventh-day Adventists, which described who they were. And then through the years, as the church grew worldwide, they put together a representative form of governance with all the moving parts fitly moving together. And with that compacted structure, with its sensible policies for the local church, 
the local conference, the local union, and the general conference with its division, they moved forward under the lead of Christ, their head. And any attack on the compact church or its decisions that the whole body makes will negative, negatively impact our mission and task at hand. You mess with the God-ordained structure of the body and it is destabilized and risks the proper function of the whole. It is God's will that the whole body be fitly joined and compacted together. The thought and the idea is simply members working together in harmony with other members churches working together in harmony with their sister churches, conferences and unions and the divisions of the general conference working together in harmony, each playing their specific roles and functions. And when challenges and, uh, and problems or issues arise, which they are apt to do with humanity down here, the church prayerfully works it out together. In general conference session. I like that, don't you? I've been to a few of them and what a blessing it has been for my life and my ministry. Representatives from all over the world come together to study God's word. To study the spirit of prophecy and pray and make decisions for the church and the furtherance of the everlasting gospel. To prepare a dying world for the soon coming of Jesus. And God who put this thing together guides the process. So that wise decisions are made in harmony with his word. And in harmony with our mission and our task at hand. Then the whole body. How much of the body? The whole body. The entire church will work together. Fitly joined together in harmony with the decisions made by the representatives. The representative parts of the general session. And if certain parts of the body continue to have issues arise, continue with problems, and do not work in harmony with the whole body, with the whole church, it is not wrong. Follow this. It is not wrong for the proper representative leaders of the whole church to prayerfully come together and put together steps to encourage the certain parts of the body that are out of harmony to come into harmony with the whole body. That's not wrong <laughs> for the different elected leaders from around the world field to get together and prayerfully uh, put together steps to work with our brothers and sisters in Christ who have some other ideas and, and, and don't feel like they can work in harmony with the church. It's not wrong for our leaders to put together that kind of plan of attack. And if someone comes along and calls such a process or a representative leader of the whole names that are inappropriate to put them down and to cause strife, that is wrong and is out of line. Listen, a representative of the world church in any of those positions, a representative leader who is humbly abiding by the decisions and policies that the whole church, the whole body has prayerfully established, a representative leader who is humbly abiding by these decisions and policies and encourages all parts and entities of the church to work in harmony with them is not some of the names that they are being called. Such a representative leader is not popish, but is God's man working in harmony with the head even Christ. And that's the kind of leader that all parts of the body can work with. 
fitly and compacted together for the cause of Christ and his church. A body owes its strength, beauty, comfort, helpfulness, happiness to the position and the proper function of the different members of which it is composed. Any book on anatomy and physiology will teach you that that is the case. We would indeed be monstrosities rather than men if any part of us should be shifted from its present and proper position and function. So try, dear friend, to be in the body of Christ where and what you were meant to be and to work in harmony with it. For Christ's church... His great Advent movement at this time is called to have every member joint and part in its proper place and function. And his church at this time is not a monstrosity. And we need to be very careful that we do not act as though we thought that she was. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the privilege that you have given us to be part of your body at this time in earth's history. We're thankful of being part of this great Advent movement, your church at this time. And we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us peace, more peace and love to work together for the great cause of ourselves growing in Christ and sharing the grand truths of this time to every nation, people, and tongue. Lead us to this, dear Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus who makes it all po possible, even the head of the church. Amen. 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 I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is tuned in to this special symposium on uh, Scripture church structure, and the path to unity. We really do appreciate you tuning in. We also appreciate the questions that have come in for our panel discussion. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you uh, some valuable materials that uh, we carry here at Secrets Unsealed. Uh, if we don't carry them, I will mention it to you. You'll have to get them some other places. But I'd like to share with you some of the materials that we have available as well as materials that I have written and prepared uh, through the course of many years of this discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention the book, The Tip of an Iceberg. This book was written by C. Raymond Holmes, a good friend. If there is one book that I would recommend everyone to read above all other books, it would be this one. Even though it was written in 1994, it is so clear on the issues, particularly the issue of hermeneutics or how we interpret the Bible. Way back there, 23 years ago, Dr. Holmes discerned all of the deep issues that are facing the church today. Uh, this book is presently out of print, but Secrets Unsealed is negotiating to reprint this book and make it available. So stay tuned about this book. Once again, The Tip of an Iceberg by C. Raymond Holmes. Then, um, I believe it was in 1999 that uh, the Andrews University Theological Seminary published the book Women in Ministry. And of course, uh, the seminary at that time uh, strongly supported the idea of ordaining women to the gospel ministry. So, in the year 2000, there was a book published in response by several scholars of the Adventist Church who were opposed to women's ordination. The name of this book is Prove All Things. It's edited by Mercedes Dyer, who was my teacher when I was at the seminary, a very fine woman, uh, but it is a book that contains a symposium of many different uh, authors concerning this issue of women's ordination. It answers many of the arguments of the pro-ordination group. Then I want to recommend a book that is written by a non-Adventist. I don't recommend many books that are written by non-Adventists, but this is a good book. Uh, we don't necessarily agree with every detail of it, but uh, the preponderance of the evidence is very, very good. 
The name of the book is Evangelical Feminism, A New Path to Liberalism. It's written by Wayne Grudem, who is a Reformed scholar. Now, uh, there's been a lot of criticism uh, against uh, the idea of using Wayne Grudem and his arguments. But I believe that many of his arguments are rock solid, and in this book he answers many of the arguments that are used by the pro-ordination group. Uh, then I have a book that I wrote uh, way back in 2012, uh, leading up to the special constituency of the Pacific Union, where the Pacific Union attempted to change its constitution to allow for women's ordination, and when the union was not able to change the constitution, they approved women's ordination anyway. Uh, I wrote a little book leading up to this uh, event called um, Reflections on Women's Ordination. Uh, it speaks about uh, uh, the, the conflict that arose around the year 2012 over the issue of women's ordination. That's where the hornet's nest uh, uh, began to uh, cause problems in the church. Uh, and then uh, we have the same book in Spanish, uh, La Ordenación de la Mujer, Si o No. So this same book is available in Spanish. Then we have a book that was written by Eugene Pruitt uh, while we were at TASC, the Theology of Ordination Study Committee. Uh, Women's Ordination, 31 Popular Arguments and Biblical Answers. Very good resource book that answers many of the points that are brought up by those who favor women's ordination. Uh, then probably many of you know that Secrets Unsealed, leading up to the General Conference session, uh, actually sponsored two symposiums here in our studio. Uh, the first one was in English, and the title of it was Women's Ordination, History, Issues, and Implications. We had several scholars that we brought in and pastors, and they presented on different aspects of this particular subject. Uh, this series is available from Secrets Unsealed for the cost of shipping. Once again, the title is Women's Ordination, History, Issues, and Implications. Uh, this series is available on DVD. Then there are several newsletter articles that I wrote uh, leading up to the vote at the General Conference session in 2015. The first of these is Reflections on Phoebe. It's claimed that Phoebe was a deacon of the church. And I go through a, a careful study of uh, her mention in Romans chapter 16, and I show that she was a servant in the church. Uh, she was not a deacon, a full-fledged deacon like the deacons in the church today. Uh, then uh, many have argued that because Deborah and Huldah were notable women in the Old Testament that played a very important role in the history of Israel, and we would not argue that point, um, I decided to write an article titled Reflections on Deborah and Huldah, uh, these two notable women from the Old Testament that made a big difference in the history of Israel. Of course, their um, prominence in the Old Testament is used by those who favor women's ordination to say that we should ordain women to the gospel ministry. Uh, then I have an article that I wrote, Reflections on Junia, Fact or Conjecture? And basically what I do in this particular article is show that Junia was not an apostle. She was a notable person known by the apostles, but she was not an apostle. Uh, then also we have a, an article that uh, was prepared by several of us who belonged to the Theology of Ordination Study Committee. Uh, TOSC group number one reviews the third option. Uh, basically, at first, at uh, the Theolo Theology of Ordination Study Committee, uh, there were only two groups, those who favored and those who were against. But towards the end of the meetings, a third option appeared, and uh, here in this article we deal with the third option. Uh, then I wrote an article for our newsletter, Reflections on Hermeneutics, because this is the really the central issue in this whole discussion, is how you interpret the Bible. And so I wrote an article bringing out the issues concerning hermeneutics as it relates to women's ordination. Then there's a sermon that I preached at GYC uh, a couple of years ago, and it's related to this. Uh, it's called The Risk of Eternal Loss. Uh, it's available on uh, YouTube. That's the name of the sermon if you want to watch it. And I also wrote a newsletter article uh, titled The Risk of Eternal Loss. 
these are some of the newsletter articles that I wrote uh, concerning the issue of women's ordination. Then uh, we have the, the book, The Adventist Ordination Crisis, which was published by Amazing Facts, but uh, many of those of us who belonged to TOSC actually uh, contributed to the arguments that are used in this book. Uh, finally, two resources that I would like to mention. Uh, first of all, and this is extremely important, I would recommend uh, people to read this because uh, it uh, basically covers the entire trajectory of the women's ordination discussion uh, from 1968 through immediately after the General Conference session in 2015. The title is Reflections on San Antonio. This is an extremely important article because it shows the different strategies and political moves that were made to attempt to approve the, uh, the ordination of women to the gospel ministry. I would highly recommend that uh, you read this rather long article in this newsletter. Finally, uh, this is not in a booklet, but uh, it's an article that I wrote, and the title of it is Biblical and Spirit of Prophecy Evidence for Male Headship. It's a good number of pages. Uh, actually, it's 33 pages. Uh, one of the big issues that is being discussed is whether the Bible teaches male headship. And I believe that this uh, document uh, proves beyond a shadow of doubt that headship not only exists after sin, but headship existed in the Garden of Eden before sin. He the idea of headship goes all the way back to eternity past. And so these are some of the resources that are available from Secrets Unsealed. Now you probably are wondering how you can get the newsletter articles, for example, uh, that I have mentioned. Uh, basically all you have to do is click on resources. Uh, go to secretsunsealed.org, our website, click on resources, and then go down to where it says newsletter articles. And uh, you click there and you'll find all of the articles that are in our newsletters, not only on women's ordination, but also on other issues. Uh, I would like to just mention in closing that if you want this article on um, headship, that also is available there on our uh, website, secretsunsealed.org. Um, we carry all of these materials with the exception of the book Evangelical Feminism by Wayne Grudem. You would have to get that uh, online or get it at an evangelical bookstore. Uh, however, all of the other resources are available from Secrets Unsealed. So I hope that uh, you will check out these resources, these materials. I believe they're clear that even though women are extremely important in the church, God has given them functions that even men cannot fulfill. Uh, they have not been called to be ordained as ministers of the gospel in the Seventh-day Adventist church. It doesn't mean that women are inferior. Far be the thought uh, from our minds that women are inferior to men. They are equal to men, but they have different functions that God has given them. So may God bless you all. And uh, I trust that this uh, town hall meeting, as well as the individual presentations, have a, been a blessing to your life. May God bless you and keep you in his care. And may God bless his church and bring unity where there is now division. Blessings to you all. Mm -hmm.